Now, you're probably asking yourself, is the fifth film in an aging horror franchise really one of the best horror films I've never seen? I'm here to tell you that's a fair question to ask, but what you'll find with Hellraiser Inferno is that it's probably one of the most interesting sequels of the punch and its journey from page to scream proves to be compelling because it is of some dispute that the final product wasn't originally intended to be a Hellraiser sequel at all. Despite many cooks being in the kitchen working on this project, the end result is quite competent and probably a testament of the talents of the film's co-writer and director, Scott Derrickson. He would of course go on to direct a small little independent film for Marvel called Doctor Strange, and he sharpened his horror tools further helming the exorcism of Emily Rose, Sinister, and the recently released The Black Phone. It doesn't work. Hang it up. Even though some of the Hellraiser sequels can be a mixed bag, this fifth entry is at least deserving of a look. So let's take another journey into hell as we dive into one of the best horror movies you never saw. So are you gonna frisk me or fuck me? After 1996's Hellraiser Bloodline went through a troubled production and became the last of the franchise to earn a theatrical release, Miramax from their genre offshoot Dimension Films looked towards the next viable step to keep the series going as they now had the rights to the franchise, beginning with Bloodline. Even though the film carried a slim $4 million budget, its 9.3 million finish didn't exactly boost confidence for its future performance on the big screen. It became clear that a follow-up would be a direct-to-video release, so the Weinsteins, yep, those guys, began looking at various pitches for what could be the next movie. One early concept was called Hellraiser Hellfire, which was pitched by Stephen Jones and Michael Marshall Smith. Their idea had the original film's final girl, Christy Cotton, facing off against a plot by a cult to bring the Leviathan and the Cenobites into the real world. The climax was a bit ambitious as it involved a large lament configuration and closing London. The description alone sounds expensive on paper, so that take on the story was rejected due to budgetary concerns. During a lot of this development, Clive Barker was still on board as producer, even confirming during an appearance on AOL in 1996 after the release of Hellraiser Bloodline that Dimension was set to make a fifth installment. However, by 1999, things clearly soured between Barker and the Weinsteins because he was dropped from the project due to the oh-so-common reason of creative differences. The situation got so bad at one point that Barker was barred from providing any assistance on the movie. What? We are so serious. Guys. You're fucking high! Are you out of your mind? Eventually, Harvey and Bob Weinstein came across a script written by Paul Harris Boardman and Scott Derrickson. The duo was so impressed by what they read that they gave Derrickson $10,000 to direct a single scene from their script as proof of concept. The director showcased his talents with his $10,000 chance, and he was ultimately given the approval to charge ahead as the film's director. On a budget of $2 million, the stage was being set to make a very different Hellraiser movie. Hellraiser Inferno finds Craig Sheffer playing Detective Joseph Thorne, a corrupt Denver police detective who's too busy indulging in drugs and infidelity to really have time to protect and serve. Thorne finds himself discovering a mysterious puzzle box at a scene that has all the markings of a ritual murder. Our corrupt detective has a fascination with puzzles, but he's not nearly prepared for what's going to happen once he solves its mysteries. Once he solves the box, Joseph is plagued by hallucinations which involve him being chased by a creature with no legs or eyes and being seduced by a twosome of mutilated women. As the story progresses, he begins to make a connection between the ritual murder he stumbled upon and a killer called the Engineer, who is now suspected of kidnapping a child. When Thorne begins to seek out the Engineer, the killer begins murdering all of his friends and creepily leaves behind one of the kid's fingers at every crime scene. If his life couldn't get much worse, Thorne begins getting therapy for his hallucinations, but it's revealed that his psychiatrist is the lead Cenobite Pinhead, and he informs him that he has been in the Cenobite's realm since the opening of the box, and all of his psychological torture has been at their hands for the sins he has afflicted upon others. 
Hellraiser Inferno, while maintaining much of the gore and mayhem that has defined its predecessors, does take a bit of a pivot in terms of overall narrative. The film is given a bit of a noirish approach that is complete with a signature sounding voiceover from the detective at the center of the story. The plot involving the engineer could very well be its own serial killer story, and sometimes the movie plays that way. The fact that this is a Hellraiser film often comes off as an afterthought, and this could be where the dispute on what this installment was supposed to be comes into play. Rumors sparked by Pinhead's Doug Bradley have said that Inferno did not originally begin as a Hellraiser sequel. The actor stated that the script was a pre-existing detective story that was rewritten to add connections to the franchise. This could very well have had some truth to it since what we know and what we love as Hellraiser does take a bit of a backseat. Minus the connection of the puzzle box, a few centibite infused hallucinations, and arguably underused Pinhead, this could easily be its own original story. In fact, Hellraiser Inferno probably owes a lot more of a debt to the films of David Lynch and Jacob's Ladder than the Hellraiser franchise itself, as it plays more like a psychological thriller. <laughs> Pinhead doesn't even make an appearance in the film until over an hour and 15 minutes into a 100-minute movie. To be fair, this does throw it back to the first installment a bit, as Pinhead and the other Cenobites don't really have a lot of screen time, but their presence is so strong that you fool yourself into thinking you've seen more of them. They're not the lead monsters, that honor falls on Julia and Frank. You could argue that reducing Pinhead screen time is a nice pivot back to how things started. However, despite Bradley's claims, Derrickson has stated that he wrote the Hellraiser spec for this film as he waited for the other projects to get the green light. So this will come down to who do you trust more, Pinhead or the guy who dabbled with the MCU? The direct-to-video limitations of the film were felt by those involved, particularly behind the scenes. Special makeups effects designer Gary G. Tunnicliffe had said that he went without payment on the project so that his staff could still be paid when he learned the budget for special effects would be a mere $50,000. Maybe it's the spirit of tenacity of Derrickson's superb vision, but they do the most with what they're given despite the limitations. There are some extreme moments of gore, and you would never guess that any of the effects were stifled by the budget. Take the moment that a pair of Cenobites caressed Thorne's chest over and under his skin, which seriously drives home the notion that pain is pleasure. We also get a cool beheading and some nightmarish dream sequences that seem completely inspired by the work of David Lynch. The first arrival of the Cenobites is also expertly executed by Derrickson as he manages to make them look terrifying yet strangely enticing. In terms of displaying some of the gore effects, the director never really holds back, and it's something he comments on his film theory book through a screen darkly. When speaking on the movie, he said, when I made Hellraiser Inferno, I went as far in that film as I would ever go as a filmmaker in terms of the graphic nature. It's a very grotesque movie. I don't like that kind of stuff, graphic violence personally, but I was making a movie about hell. And one of my ambitions with that movie was to create a portrayal of hell that had some personal significance to me. You can really tell Derrickson is flexing the creative muscles he'll use in some of his future films, the videotape with the engineer, which features a lot of creepily effective video cassette grain and filters, is something he would prove upon in 2012 Sinister. Thorne is also into close-up magic, and you can see shades of what the director would explore in Doctor Strange, these are just the humble beginnings, but he was certainly proving that he had a genre voice worth listening to. The film also plays around with a genuinely jolting sound design that packs a visceral impact on nearly the same level as the gore that's sprayed across the screen. Some of the scenes of violence we don't get to see, but the torture we hear ends up being far more frightening. The movie also plays with visual frights that leave you unsettled, in one scene, there's a man with a stretched face that laughs like a child and it plays into Thorne's gradual mental decline. Is he losing his mind, or has he really found himself in some kind of hell? Craig Sheffer really is the only performer of significance in Hellraiser Inferno as Detective Joseph Thorne. He completely owns the role. The character isn't likable at the start, but you grow to care about him enough as he battles what's real and what's truly making him lose his mind. The performance gets gradually unhinged, but he avoids scenery chewing and never goes too far over the top. As for Doug Bradley, by this point he could play Pinhead in his sleep, but the character takes on 
a bit of a character shift here. He comes off more like a higher power that is passing along moral judgment against Thorn and all of his misdeeds. He's also regulated to a cameo role, and that has been a bone of contention with fans who were less enthralled by the psychological aspects of the story and simply wanted more Pinhead. During an interview on the DVD release, Bradley appeared to like what the film accomplished, and he also expressed his pleasure with the fact that Pinhead came off more like a neutral character with the humans serving as the true villains of the story, much like they were in the first two films. Hellraiser Inferno was released on October 3rd, 2000, and reviews among genre fans weren't all that abysmal. The film received more mixed notices from horror aficionados, which some thinking it strayed too far from the Hellraiser DNA, while others praised it for trying something different. The film is 20% on Rotten Tomatoes, but before you read too much into that, it's only based on a collection of five reviews. Esquire gave the film solid notices, calling the film shockingly good, and went on to say Inferno feels less like a Hellraiser movie than a follow-up to Jacob's Ladder or maybe even a predecessor to Silent Hill, floating dreamlike through hallucinatory David Lynchian visions and downplaying plot in favor of the surreal. We here at Joe Blow cover the film for the fucking Black Sheep column, and we considered it not only the second best sequel in the franchise, but in very much the same way it was as Halloween 3, a movie that's far more meritorious on its own accord rather than as a tethered franchise addendum. Not all reviews were kind, with Mike Massey from Gone with the Twins saying, the grisly violence and nightmarishly hallucinatory imagery returns now accompanied by appalling sound effects that significantly amplify the brutality. In her 1.5 out of 5 review, Jenny Kermode of I for Film said, Consider watching it again and suddenly the idea of having your flesh torn apart by meat hooks for eternity won't sound so bad after all. For all Derrickson's current success, it is interesting that it all started with a script and a $10,000 shot with Hellraiser Inferno. The sequel might be polarizing because it doesn't walk a familiar line that fans have been accustomed to, but it does deserve credit for attempting to do something different with a franchise that was definitely showing its age. And at the end of the day, we get a hellishly entertaining fresh take that stands out amongst the later sequels of the series. <laughs>